everybody. I'm Susan McTiernan, and I have the pleasure of serving as Dean of the Cabelli School of Business here at Roger Williams University. Um, I have had a chance to say hello to a lot of our alumni already today. Um, it's great to have you all with us, and I see some other familiar faces, as well as parents and friends and faculty of the Cabelli School, and I welcome you all here this afternoon. I am so sorry about the rain. We did the best we could to hold it off, but uh, it didn't, all those prayers didn't work. We're now starting on the graduation prayers for a sunny day, so if those of you who are planning to be here on the 20th for commencement could join with us so that we don't have a day like this, it would be really helpful. Um, this is one of my favorite events of the year. Uh, it seems like we were just together in December uh, listening to the uh, research and the analysis and the results of the investment program at the Gabelli School Cafe, uh, the Center for Advanced Financial Education. Uh, this is an extremely uh, hardworking and talented group of students, and I know firsthand because I've seen all the buzzing in our building leading up to this big event that takes place once a semester, uh, and I want to thank them ahead of time for all of the great work that's led to us being together here today. I know it's going to be an exciting and interesting afternoon, and I want to also mention that for time planning purposes, we do have a little reception plan for after this, so you can uh, talk with the students and about their strategies or about anything else and those of us from the business school will be around as well to talk individually with people. And, and if you have questions about the program, I'm happy to answer them, or Dr. Melton is happy to answer them. Um, and I want to say a special thank you to Dr. Michael Melton, who has been uh, the catalyst behind this program and the founder of the program. And um, this is always a great afternoon. So I thank all the students. I want to introduce to you now Chris Gilman and Adam Delmonico, who are the uh, associate directors of the CAFE funds, and they'll be getting the presentation started. Gentlemen. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this semester's CAFE presentation. We'd like to start by introducing to you the 10 student fund managers standing before you. To my right is Frank Dupuy, Clay Caggiano, Chris Aquina, Frank Goldman, and Alec Mendez. To the left, we have Zach Morin, Anthony D'Amico, Sean Sweeney, Aaron Kenny, and Charles Moyer. Now, as you will learn, the student fund managers have the unique opportunity to manage two real dollar equity portfolios with differing objectives, one being a growth fund, while the other a value fund. As many of you know, traditionally we present both the portfolio methodology and performance of each fund. However, today we're going to mix things up a little bit and focus just on our growth fund. Why, you might ask? To put it simply, the performance on both a raw and risk-adjusted basis of the CAFE Growth Fund throughout 2017 is unprecedented since the inception of this program. This success is largely due to the effort and determination of the gentleman that you see behind us. We hope this presentation will not only walk you through our portfolio methodology, but also highlight a few of the key companies that have helped make this semester so special. Without any further ado, we'd like to invite up Clayton and Zach to begin the presentation. So what is growth? By definition, a growth objective is where we search for stocks with a short-term outlook in which we see capital gains. For example, growth companies are more likely to take their profits and reinvest it back in their current business rather than pay this money back out to shareholders. This can help fund such things as acquisitions and expansion projects in order to help drive growth in both the short and long term. Now taking this into consideration, with us looking for more short-term appreciation, we do take on slightly more risk than we would if we were allocating to a value fund. With the growth aspect of our objective, we need to be slightly more risk tolerant. They need to understand, with our holding period of just 10 weeks, this can sometimes be nerve wracking. When we're searching for growth companies for our fund to allocate, we think of ourselves as fishermen with a large net. Once we cast this large net into the ocean, we catch a multitude of different fish in which we inspect each and every one. By building our net with short term growth drivers, we can ensure that we'll pick the best possible company. We cast this net to ensure that we analyze every aspect that has the potential to move the stock's price within the short term. From there, we can properly use the current market conditions in order to, turn, in order to target the current industries that are thriving. So how bountiful has the catch been this year? Let's just say we caught the right fish at the right time. In short, we try to minimize our risk while maximizing our return. In the end, this gives us a portfolio that will outperform the market, fulfilling our fiduciary responsibilities. Our year-to-date growth raw return is 9.07%. Our holding period raw return is 3.85%. It's important to notice that we are comparing very well against industry fund professionals such as Gamco, Goldman Sachs, and JP Morgan. 
While our return is important to us, we also like to take into account our fund on a risk-adjusted basis. Now, we apply the industry standard measure, alpha, into our performance. A common phrase used throughout the CAP beta semester to motivate us has been seek alpha, sleep later. A saying that's put a testament each and every day. Now, risk-adjusted returns measures our performance based on the risk that we take on in our portfolio. Anyone can outperform the market in a bull market by taking on more risk, as defined by beta, or by taking on less risk in a bear market. Thus, the only measure that should matter to an educated investor is risk-adjusted. You see, with a year-to-date alpha of 2.47% and a holding period alpha of 3.13%, we are clearly outperforming the market on a risk-adjusted basis. Now, we had a sharp ratio of 5.9, and the market had a sharp ratio of 0.26. This just illustrates that given the amount of total risk that we take on, we're performing 25 times better than the market based on that measure. We are very proud of the hard work we put in this semester. Chris, we're proud. Oh, I'm so proud. <laughs> <laughs> and we can't wait to share with you how we've been so successful. Before we explain what led to the success of the CAFE growth on this semester, we would first like to look at our portfolio weight statistics to give you greater insight into what it is we do from day one. Within our CAFE objective, we place extra emphasis on certain fundamentals that we feel are the most important, these being beta, price to earnings, EPS growth, and the PEG ratio. We look for a high EPS growth rate as earnings directly affects a company's stock price in the short term. The price to earnings ratio is a multiple that shows what an investor is willing to pay in order to get one dollar of a company's earnings. Now, typically we look for companies trading with low PE ratios. We know that this is typically tough in such a bull market as so many companies are trading at such high premiums. In terms of beta, we typically look for a number greater than one as our investors are willing to take on slightly more risk for the potential of higher returns. Now, another risk metric that we look at is standard deviation. This shows how a stock moves on a daily basis. Now we need to make sure that every company within our fund matches up to our risk tolerance levels. I'd like to invite up Aaron and Charles to help me explain how economics plays a key role in our investment strategy. Now, as Doc is always telling us, we must be constantly aware of the market dynamics at play in both our global and domestic market, and also within our short term and our long term. During the first day as student fund managers, we pulled the first of many all-nighters in which we analyzed key events, news, and forecasted every possibility in order to define global and domestic market drivers. In industry, this is known as the top-down approach. We begin with a global and domestic market analysis and then move to specific sector and industry analyses. After we do this, we simply have to choose the companies that are best positioned moving forward based on current market trends. Through this process, we use fundamental, behavioral, and technical analysis. In this way, CAFE is sequential, and that every process is carried out with the prior research in mind. This helps us understand key events such as the impact of the new Trump administration, rising interest rates, oil prices, and many other market events that made our time at CAFE especially interesting. Now, over the course of the following week, we had to put on our economist caps and perform our global macroeconomic analysis looking at every relevant economic indicator and also taking into account every bit of news that we could find on our global markets to stay up to date. During our global market analysis, we analyzed over 30 major markets, including every economic indicator. These include GDP, inflation, unemployment, and interest rates, as they give us a better overall view of the current economic environment of these countries, as well as drivers they may have moving forward. Now, although this chart may be difficult for those of you to see in the back, let me just take a minute to highlight one of these columns here, as this is the most important thing to take away. Now, red cells indicate a bearish outlook on that market, while green cells indicate a bullish outlook. And since we had more bearish outlooks on our international uh, worldview, we saw that we did not want to allocate to there, as there is too much uncertainty regarding events like the French election, Brexit, and also the decreasing value of the euro. Within our analysis, we also looked at the country's reporting standards. So for example, countries like Italy and Russia, they don't fully disclose information on their financial statements, so we had a bearish approach to these countries. And to add to these disclosure issues, we also saw issues with ADRs, or American Depository Receipts, not tracking their underlying assets in foreign markets. And I give a little background, an ADR lets an investor put their money into a foreign market on their own domestic exchange. And we saw issues with them not tracking, for example, your foreign asset the ADR supposedly tracks may go up 10%, while the ADR that you hold may only appreciate 5 And this could be a nightmare for any potential investor go, going abroad to, look, to put their money in. 
Based on these global economic factors, we narrowed our view to our domestic market. But to justify this, we had to perform a thorough domestic market analysis. Therefore, we, made, we looked at 16 key major domestic economic indicators, such as housing starts, business sales and inventories, and GDP. We, we did this to look at the forecasted last trends and also the forecasted uh, next trends too. And in addition to that, we also saw that the Federal Reserve was maintaining their goals of implementing their monetary policy to boost price stability and also employment as well. And this indicated that our domestic economy was the strongest one out of all the others. Based on these factors regarding the domestic market, we then had to look for catalysts that would push our fund moving forward within the next year. Our domestic market was being driven by Trump's pro-growth policies, such as increasing government spending in the areas of infrastructure and military spending, as well as the possibility of tax cuts that we have seen increase consumer sentiment throughout the semester. Therefore, after we concluded our domestic and global macroeconomic analysis, we were moderately bullish on the United States economy, as we saw that many of the major growth drivers permitted resided right here. Now, many industry professionals in the room today are probably wondering, why do we perform such a thorough global and domestic market analysis instead of simply picking countries that are hot today? Well, to answer that question, you have to understand that CAFE, the key word is drivers. And these drivers are identified in the top-down approach, and they play a vital role in our decision making. And also, we saw that, uh, you know, as analysts, we gotta be constantly aware of what's going on around us, and we gotta know what sectors are driving the market today. So for example, if a, if, if a sector like technology is driving the market, then the next thing an analyst has to ask themselves is what industry and what specific company within that industry is driving the whole sector. To give an example of this, within the tech sector, we saw an industry like infrastructure software being driven by themes like cloud computing. Within this industry, we identified VMware, a network virtualization software company that was poised for growth moving forward. Thus, you have a vision of our top-down approach. Now, before we get to our holdings, we want to let you in on a little secret that we had that led us to such success. There are hundreds of other funds out there with the same objective and similar holdings to that of the Cafe Growth Fund. They might be wondering, why are we performing differently? Why would you want to invest in us rather than that of our competitors? Simply put, it's just the weightings that we put on each and every company. And how did we get these weightings, you might ask? The top-down analysis that we just performed. After the hours of research have been completed, the presentations have all been pitched, and the voting is finalized, we are still not done with our portfolio allocation process, as it is now time to, to assign weightings to each and every security with our, within our fund to ensure we are targeting the correct industries and matching our risk tolerance. After allocation, we uh, overweight and underweight sectors that we feel more or less comfortable with. So we overweighted two sectors, such as technology and healthcare. The reason for overweighting technology is not only because of their dominance in the market as of late, but also because of key growth drivers backing them, such as cloud computing, internet of things, and also autonomous driving. As Clayton has mentioned, we also overweighted the healthcare sector. As at the time of our allocation, we saw it as undervalued and sought short-term price appreciation opportunities. Yet on the other hand, we underweight sectors that we're a lot less confident in. So as you can see, we underweighted energy and consumer staples. We underweighted energy due to the fact that the commodity oil has been dragging the price of energy companies down. And we've also underweighted consumer staples as it's usually seen as a defensive sector and we didn't see quite as many uh, possibilities for short-term capital gains. These sector allocations are crucial to our fund as overweighting those sectors that outperform the market helps us gain alpha. Inversely, underweighting those sectors that lie within the market hedges us against their poor performance. As you can see, we have a sector weighting scheme that takes a slightly more aggressive approach. This is due to things such as our objective as well as our current moderately bullish outlook on the current market and economy. Now, as you see, we've given, taken the liberty to give each and every one of you a pen, so we do encourage you to write down some of the tickers that we go through. However, just know, even if you write these down, you'll never have the same particular weightings that this fund does. It is now time for our big reveal, as we will show you each and every holding within our growth fund that has led us to the alpha we are presenting to you today. As you can see, we're very proud of our holdings that we have, and you might see only four of them have negative holding period yields. However, we know going into the future, these companies will have the growth drivers to back them and take them to get gains. For those of you in the back, don't worry. Inside your folder, you've been provided a cafe growth fund fact sheet that shows our holdings in their entirety. Now, without further ado, I would like to go into our portfolio as I call up Brent and Anthony to discuss one of our top holdings, Lamb Research. 
company that is a key representation of growth is none other than LAM Research. LAM Research is a semiconductor manufacturing company that produces wafer fabrication and memory equipment. They essentially make the chips that power most of our phones and electronic devices. LAM Research made into our fund based on their outstanding fundamental metrics as compared to their direct competitor, Applied Materials. Now, LAM exhibits strong increasing and decreasing trends we look for in a growth company, such as a low PEG and a low PE. Additionally, LAM has a high inventory turnover and gross profit margin. This tells us that LAM not only moves its inventory quicker, but also makes more profit per sale. Additionally, when comparing LAM to its direct competitor, Applied Materials, and industry leader, LAM has clearly outperformed. With con continued demand for memory chips, in relating areas such as consumer devices, big data, autonomous vehicles, and other tech-related themes, we see LAM poised for growth in the future. It is this due diligence at the beginning of each semester in the cafe that ensures that we have the best growth companies moving forward. Additionally, fundamental metrics change over time, as seen with LAM Research being the better poised growth company now going forward, compared to AMAP, a company that's been previously held by prior cafe groups. Although fundamentals are the basis for any great company, Clay and Zach will take you through how we ensure we pick a winner. Now, we hate to keep talking to you guys about technology companies, but Adobe was one we really wanted to bring to you. You guys might be familiar with Adobe by the annoying pop-ups you get on your computer every other day. However, this company is much more than that. When the technology sector, it is imperative that companies continue to innovate in order to thrive and outpace their competitors. This is exactly why Adobe has performed so well during our holding period, but more importantly, is so positioned for growth in the future. We all know Adobe, as we utilize their products each and every day. Some services you might be familiar with from Adobe are Adobe Reader and Adobe Photoshop. However, going forward, they're changing their entire business to be more of a subscription-based service rather than just licensing their softwares. More importantly, Adobe is currently growing two of their highest innovation product segments, which include their cloud marketing service and mobile segment. Also, Adobe displays great financial trends position for growth, as you can see by these annual operating cash flows. If you'll look, these mirror that of a stairway, or as we like to joke, a stairway to alpha. Now, <laughs> these two factors combine to create a very strong earnings history for Adobe. Over the past eight quarters, Adobe's beaten EPS all eight times, while also being analyst estimations of revenue the past six of eight quarters. As Zach was talking about, we were so confident within Adobe, we actually held it while we were halfway across the world in Japan as it went into earnings. So as we saw, Overnight, it beat earnings per share, revenues, and also had a favorable guidance going forward, and it actually appreciated 3.81% just overnight, and that's the short-term gains we love in our growth fund. I can speak for my fellow student fund managers when I say as analysts in the cafe, we live and breathe financial statements. I'd like to call up Alec and Sean as they tell you another example of our holding Foot Locker and also how it utilizes industry-specific ratios. Here, I'd like to give you all a brief insight to what it is to look at a company's financial statements. As you can see, this can be quite tough to, to locate specific data for a company. Luckily, when you utilize platforms such as Bloomberg, we're easily to locate this data and graph it accordingly for our research. When observing a company's financial statements, we look at liquidity, profitability, activity, and leverage ratios. These types of ratios show if a company has cash, can pay off debt, and if they're operating effectively. Several key ratios that we look at include return on equity, inventory turnover, and the current ratio. Now, I know that everyone in this room has at least been in a footlocker once or twice. Now let me tell you why this is one company that you need to hold within every one of your funds. Foot Locker, a specialty retail shoe store, has been significantly outperforming its peers within a struggling brick and mortar industry. When looking at retail, one key element you have to look at is same store sales. This is a comparison of revenue generated by existing stores of a company during the same time a year ago. Currently, in the S&P and retail, there are only eight companies that put that metric positive in the last four quarters. Foot Locker, on the other hand, has had positive same-store sales for the last 28 quarters. Their direct competitors, such as Finish Line and Dick's Sporting Goods, are inconsistent when it comes to this ratio, showing us that Foot Locker was the one that we wanted to hold within our fund. Now, another element to look at in sectors, especially within discretionary, is the cyclicality of a stock. With Foot Locker, there's a strong trend favoring this company through quarters one and four. This is where Foot Locker generates most of its sales. This is due to factors such as the holiday season. Now, you might be wondering why we decide to invest in Foot Locker outside of their successful holiday season. As you can see, with their earnings per share increasing on a year over year basis in quarters two and three, they're poised for growth, not only during the holiday season, but for the entire year. They've also shown immunity to industry-specific trends, as you can see that their total sales are increasing year over year. 
now I'd like to bring attention over to our telecom board. Now within the telecom sector, we have limited options when investing in the domestic market. But T-Mobile was a clear winner. Now just by show of hands, how many people use T-Mobile for their wireless carrier? Not that many. <laughs> but, but don't worry, this company is poised for growth and in a few years everyone will want a piece of this company. T-Mobile was a great candidate for our growth fund as it had a great EPS growth rate, a low peg, and a solid beta. Not to mention, they were stealing market share from big names like AT&T and Verizon. We position ourselves in this company because it has far more growth potential than any domestic or global telecom company. It's also important to note that this company outperformed our key metrics we look for compared to its competitors like Verizon. Now, we see T-Mobile as a strong company moving forward as they increase their CapEx spending, increase their earnings, and increase their revenue license. Now the market is heavily driven by what spectrum you own. So essentially a spectrum gives you the right for a certain frequency at a location and companies like T-Mobile and Verizon buy these spectrums so they can have that frequency at that location. So companies can purchase these spectrum licenses and get uh, a range of frequencies from low to high. So typically companies go for the low frequencies as these are the better service frequencies and they can travel through buildings and cities which is what makes them better. So typically, um, the big names such as AT&T and Verizon hold these spectrum licenses. However, we'd like to note that T-Mobile spent a whopping $8 billion this year to acquire a uh, solid market share in the low frequency game. So we see them as a strong, uh, strong competitor moving forward. And I know that you all will want to call T-Mobile right now, but I do ask you to wait as we have Clayton and Chris come up and talk about Raytheon. Well, you may never buy a Raytheon missile. By getting into our phones, you can get into a piece of this aerospace and defense behemoth. Raytheon has been a company that has been fueling our fund uh, as we've seen it trading a lot off behavioral news. With all the positive news and contracts surrounding Raytheon, we had no choice but to set our sights on this great company. Now, Raytheon, an integrated defense company that distributes military-grade equipment to international governments as well as private contractors, is one of our winners this semester. Um, as we've seen many companies in the industrial sector kind of stagnate or trade in congestion after the so-called Trump bump, we've seen Raytheon only go higher um, off behavioral news. We actually recently saw the U.S. increase their product usage of Raytheon's products, such as the Tomahawk missile. Now, investors saw this news and increased their stake in the company, allowing the stock price to increase. Now, we've been telling you how this company has performed for us. Let me tell you why it's one of the best growth companies going forward. With increased geopolitical tensions as well as increased military spending, we know Raytheon will be one of the best growth companies to hold in your fund. So news isn't the only behavioral aspect that we look at when it comes to our growth fund. We also go into things like the habits of consumers. One company who has benefited greatly from the changing consumer spending habits is Amazon. Now, working as an online bookstore just a few years ago, turning to a company that has cornered the e-commerce market, just imagine where they'll be a few years from now. Amazon is the essence of a growth company as it constantly adapts to changing consumer needs, updates its user-friendly platform, and not to mention its increasing stock price. Now, with millions of consumers having online accessibility to purchase products anywhere at any time, Amazon has reaped the benefits from this tremendously. One growth driver Amazon has moving forward is their diversification in the revenue segments. So I'm sure most of you think as uh, Amazon as an e-commerce store. However, they also have their foot in cloud computing. Approximately over 6% is in cloud computing now. Over the past few years, they've gained heavy market share in this industry, and we see them as a market leader moving forward. With Amazon expanding upon their diversification amongst the revenue segments, there's many reasons why we are so bullish on this company in the coming years. While we typically take companies long, we also like to uh, play a little short-term gains, and we do that through playing company earnings. One of the differentiating factors between the CAFE program and that of our peers is the student fund manager's ability to play earnings. Playing earnings basically means that we purchase a stock the day before their quarterly earnings report in anticipation, in anticipation of a positive price movement after. Doc stresses we play earnings for two reasons. One, it makes us look at a multitude of factors within a company, such as whether it will be earnings per share, revenues, and have a favorable guidance going forward. But he also makes us do it because it doesn't get any more real world than this. Taking a company into earnings, we can see it appreciate X amount overnight. During our time in CAFE, we have had 88% of our holdings who reported hit earnings, causing a positive price movement. 
Also, what's more impressive is that a vast majority of these companies' direct competitors have missed on their earnings. Now, I'd like to show you an example as we talk about our earnings play, Hasbro. One company who was added to our fund prior to their earnings was Hasbro. Now, many of you may know Hasbro is one of the two major toy manufacturers on the market competing directly against Mattel. Chances are, if you walk in any toy store today and pick up a product, it's most likely made by either one of these two companies. We discovered an inverse price reaction upon earnings between these two competitors. What this showed is that when one competitor missed, the other typically beat and had a positive price reaction the next day. After Mattel missed earnings and fell 12%, we identified this as an investment opportunity for a company like Hasbro, who is also taking market share from Mattel within the toy industry. Now we were able to capture a 6.8% gain overnight while not getting greedy the next morning when the price was fluctuating between 5 and 8%. I'd now like to bring up Anthony and Aaron to talk about one of my favorite companies, Line Technology. So we do play earnings in the short term, but we also take our long holdings through earnings. And this is a company we did this with, is uh, Align Technology. And the great thing about Align is when we were deciding to put them into our fund, we did it more so on a behavioral basis, citing specific market dynamics at play, like the fact that they have very little direct competition and they had a very underpinned industry at play. Now, initially, the street had priced in a price target uh, below what Align was trading at. However, after a solid earnings beat and a 27% price increase, the, the street quickly reevaluated. And another great thing about Align that made them a behavioral play for us was the effect of the ACA, or Affordable Care Act. Now, we would like to note that the GOP has recently introduced a new bill into Congress that has just passed through the, health, the House. But we would also like to note that this bill also includes teen dental health benefits as one of their essential benefits under their line. And so the reason we like Align so much is because they've been mainly focusing their products and services on teens specifically, which is a rapidly growing market for them. And thus, we think they're going to take this advantage more so than any of its peers. Now, we see a line as a long-term holding going further because they can diversify away from uh, behavioral news. So after that, I'd like to introduce the next group. So. Once fundamental and behavioral analysis has been conducted, we then utilize technicals in order to find the ideal buying points for these solid selections in order to increase our holding period yield. There are numerous technical indicators we use when conducting technical analysis. These indicators allow us to see, measure, and explain certain price moves and trends within the stock. RSI, or Relative Strength Index, is an example of one of these indicators that allows us to see whether a stock price is overbought or oversold at a certain time. When we're buying into these holdings, we try to buy in when RSI is around the oversold level of 30 instead of the overbought level of 70. Another indicator is MACD, or Moving Average Convergence Divergence. Wrong name. But this indicator <laughs> tracks the momentum of the stock price movement. The area between the MACD line to the single line shows if this price movement is, is speeding up or slowing down. Now a good buying point is almost as necessary to a stock price's appreciation as water is to life. Now a company that deals with both of these factors is Xylem Incorporated, a water treatment and flow control equipment company. Xylem is seen trading at a low in mid-April, where the RSI is showing that it's oversold. We took advantage of this buying point, and days later the stock price appreciated. Not only is Xylem an example of a good technical play, we also see this company appreciating moving forward due to their initiatives in the U.S. water infrastructure remodeling. Finally, we use moving averages to determine certain price trends within stock. Simple moving average lines include short-term lines, such as 10 to 20 day lines, or long-term lines, such as 50 to 100 day lines. Investors look for crossings of these lines, as they can indicate a change in price trends. For SPGI, at the beginning of February, its short-term moving average was crossing the other moving averages. We bought into this holding when the 50-day line was about to cross the 100-day line. This cross initiated an optimal buying point for us, for a company that we saw benefiting from increased bond issuance volume, just adding to their growth potential. Now, another play that we'd like to mention is UNH here, as we have to be constantly aware of the market dynamics at play, and also note when a good buying point presents itself, and that's exactly what happened here with UNH. You see, urgency is really needed within the cafe so that we can react quickly to the market environment because it's always changing and very unpredictable. After our fundamental and behavioral analysis identified this healthcare giant as a stock poised to take off, we became technicians. 
We saw that the stock was traded in a congestion zone for roughly two months before it fell 3.67%. And this brought it back down to its level of support indicated here, from which it rose with strong momentum. And after we bought in, we were able to capture some of this momentum, and thus we were rewarded with a 6.86% price appreciation. Now let us explain why this Dow stock is still positioned for growth. With increased Medicare enrollment, an aging population, and their Optum segment that is revolutionizing the way individuals receive care at home, this company is worth holding throughout the remainder of the year. Not to mention, it's got the best Medicaid plans in the industry, as you can see reflected in the white line here. It has been outpacing Anthem, its direct competitor, and the managed care industry for some time now. Now within technical analysis, it goes farther than just watching for a stock price to hit a level of support. We have to utilize intraday technicals like VWAP to find a more precise buying point. JP Morgan Chase, a blue chip money center bank, provides financial services and retail banking all across the globe. More importantly, it is an example of a company where we are able to utilize our volume weighted average pricing metric, or the VWAP, to identify an optimal buying point. The viewer lets us see real-time upticks and downticks in order to find a perfect buying point. For JPM, we watch the price move down from 86.10 down to 85.72, where we identified a level of support in which we bought to this holding. After buying in, we saw the price increase to 85.75. Uh, we were able to immediately capitalize on these price gains. You're all probably thinking that, that all these gains seem kind of minimal, but when dealing with large quantities of money, it makes all the difference in the long run. This is just another example of technical analysis that's allowed us to see price appreciation as soon as the buy button was hit. Not only is this an example of how we use VWAP, JPM is persistent well for the upcoming years. With deregulation through possible dot fank reforms and also the increasing interest rate environment, JPM is being driven by strong economic growth drivers that will provide gains for the years to come. Now, unfortunately, not all of our holdings can perform as we would like. This is seen here with Prudential Insurance as they have a holding period yield of below negative 3%. However, myself and my fellow sector analyst, Brent, are going to tell you why this company is still perfectly positioned for the future. Prudential is a multi-line insurer that focuses on life insurance, annuities, retirement services, and investment options for both institutional and individual clients. Through our top-down approach, we identified the insurance industry based on its prior performance through 2004 to 2006 in the last rising interest rate environment. With economists predicting two interest rate hikes of 25 basis points in the coming year, Prudential has the opportunity to capitalize on heightened reinvestment yields. Also, combining this macroeconomic factor with the demographic factor of an aging population that is going to kickstart the pension risk transfer segment, Prudential is, not, Prudential is still well positioned for growth. Based on these fundamental metrics, we see that Prudential is still poised for solid growth moving forward, compared to that of the overall insurance industry. With this being said, we feel well positioned within this industry moving forward, forward with a company like Prudential. This is why we can ensure you that Prudential will be positive by year end. So, another company that had underperformed in our short term time horizon was Celgene. Now, Celgene, we would like to know, although it underperformed the broader sector, we still did have a positive holding period deal for us. And what initially attracted us to them in the first place was the fact that they were in growing industries like immunology, oncology, hematology, and inflammation therapies. With our top-down approach, we indicated that the biotech industry had excellent growth moving forward due to increasing industry trends such as cancer research and innovative therapies. And within the company itself, Celgene is making strides to become the next leader in the biopharmaceuticals industry on every frontier. Now, what we mainly attribute to Celgene's strength is its robust pipeline of new and developing drugs, as you can see here, which will propel the stock further in the future, more so than any of its competitors. Celgene was stealing market share with its drug Revlimid. Now, this is a blood cancer drug that's one of the best in the world. And in addition to that, that wasn't enough. We also see that they are increasing their partnerships and acquisitions uh, to diversify away their revenue streams and also create a position for them where they can go into growing markets. In addition to that, now, you may be wondering like, why invest in selling the underperformed sector and uh, didn't do so great within our fund, but we see that their market position, their pricing power, and their amazing performance over the last couple of years will propel them in the future and reach new higher highs. 
So now that we've brought you through some of our growth holdings, we'd like to take this time to review a few key points from the semester and begin to introduce our value fund. So as you guys and any good analysts know, one must always be self-evaluating and holding themselves accountable, not just for the great trades, but for those decisions that didn't quite pan out. While we do see similar trends within the market, it is important to note that history does not repeat itself. This can be seen in the oil market. In 2008, oil, along with the stock market, reached all-time highs. However, oil is currently trading at historically low levels as the market continues to reach new highs. In the cafe, we train analysts to make educated decisions based off of calculated probabilities. Through the analysis of historical trends, we look to see where the market is headed next based on where it has been in the past. One of the greatest lessons the student fund managers can learn is the different train of thought that goes into seeking value in a company over a longer time horizon. We'd like to note that due to the uncertainty of the Trump bump and the lack of clarity entering 2017, the Gabelli Value Fund was liquidated in December of 2016. This certainly added a mountain of pressure to these analysts as they were now responsible for allocating an entire fund rather than just a few holdings. Additionally, because the Value Fund is allocated after the Growth Fund, we missed out on a large portion of the growth in quarter one of 2017. This can be seen in our year-to-date performance. So far through 2017, we've returned 4.86% on a raw basis, which not only puts us in line, but ahead of many of our industry competitors. What we are thrilled to bring you guys today is our 22 basis points of alpha that have been generated since the allocation of this fund. This illustrates that these student fund managers have been successful in allocating a value portfolio towards the latter part of the semester under the constraints set by DOC. Now I'd like to bring up CJ and Sean to touch on some of the key points in our value fund. Everyone talks about value. You hear from big name investors like Warren Buffett. So what exactly is value? In contrast to the growth fund where we cast a wide net, value investing uses a single line designed to catch one fish that aligns perfectly with our fund objective. Now within value, we focus on companies rather than the stocks themselves. Our goal is to find companies that are trading below their intrinsic value. Our buy and hold strategy allows us to capitalize on the fact that increasing cash flows and solid fundamentals will return a stock's price to fair market valuation, if not exceed that in the near future. Now I'd like to bring up my fellow student fund manager, Alec, just to touch on the correlation matrix in the value fund. Now one model that we place extra emphasis on within our value fund is our correlation matrix. This shows the direct correlation between any two companies within our fund. As we do have a longer term approach with this fund, we want to make sure that no two companies are moving in the exact same way. This is important to know because if you want to invest between two companies that are highly correlated, it's not worth to invest in both these companies rather than just one of them. Even if both these companies have vastly different operations, if they both move the same way in the market, you will not be properly diversifying your portfolio. The properly diversified funds which have as many negative correlations as possible. We are very proud of this model and feel that every one of these companies is poised for growth in the next three to five years. Now, I'd like to bring up Anthony so we can talk about value funds returns. We allocated our fund on April 4th, 2017. Now, we like to track our funds against uh, different indices depending on their objectives. For example, we track our value fund against the S&P 500 and the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Now, to give you a little insight on our performance in this portfolio, we performed a holding period yield of 22 bips positive and a year-to-date yield of negative 1.46%. Now, we'd like to note that this is on a risk-adjusted basis. Now, you might have noticed our year-to-date is rather low. This is due to us early on being overly exposed to financials when the financial sector took a hit. However, when we've completed our final allocation into the value fund, our alpha greatly improved due to our proper allocation in, among the other sectors. Our, compares, uh, our comparison of performance against other competitors was also in line with expectations, regardless of this very performance. Now, we know you guys are going to hate to see uh, this presentation, and just as much as we'll hate to leave this fund, uh, but we feel you have enough tickers on your piece of paper to, so to speak, go and start your own fund, if, you, if you'd like. Um, I'd like to give the floor to Clay and Zach to give a final remark. Now, you may be asking, how is the cafe capable of this performance? After all, we became student fund managers just three short months ago. The secret behind CAFE and what makes it so special is that we do everything in a way that directly re replicates industry. Clayton will begin to explain this as we take you through our hierarchy of management. At the top, we have our executive director, Dr. Michael Melton, 
followed by our managing director, Ms. Carla Puccini, then followed by two associate directors, Mr. Chris Gilman and Mr. Adam Del Monaco. Through this hierarchy, we're able to effectively communicate every single day and be able to successfully and actively manage two funds. This is not the only way we mirror industry hybrid. As you can see, we are required to wear a suit and tie every day to promote a professional workplace. Also, student fund managers are given the privilege to utilize industry-level platforms in order to increase their skill set and familiarity. In the cafe, we use Bloomberg terminals for industry standards. We also use money.net for real-time data as well as technical indicators. And we use Zach's reports to compare our industry analysis to those in the street. When we first stepped into the cafe, we knew that this was no normal classroom setting. Doc had transformed from a professor to our boss, and for the first time in our academic career, we had to act as analysts, not students. Every task, every question, and every assignment that was given to us was done with due diligence and handed in exactly on time. Of course, other institutions do manage real dollar portfolios, but how many, how many of them can boast that they manage two real dollar portfolios with differing objectives while, manage them, while managing them through an active management strategy? We know in this industry you need something to take you to the top, and we feel like CAFE definitely makes us stand out. And we cannot thank our director, Dr. Michael Melton, enough for the knowledge that he has passed on to us. Lastly, CAFE has taught us to work together. As a student fund manager staying before me, we were all strangers just three months ago. And now we can all safely say that we are one big family. We thank you for listening to our presentation, and we would love to open up the floor to any questions that you might have. Um, I do have to point out one student, Anthony D'Amico, is the first ever mechanical engineer um, ever to be in the program, and he actually has a final. Thank you. He actually has a final capstone presentation, so he can't stay right now for the Q&A, um, but he did a fantastic job throughout the semester, and we're proud of him, so thank you. Now we'd like to open the floor to questions. <laughs> <laughs> we approximately started with $95,000. Um, if you're looking for a percentage, our year to date return is upwards of 10% today. Uh, we are currently managing around $106,000 right now. So that wow. is a fun number. That is amazing. Sorry. Uh, first of all, a great job out there, guys. Uh, so, my question was. What would you say is the most difficult um, macroeconomic or political trend that you guys face this semester? So I think for us it was obviously uh, the political uncertainty in not only in the Eurozone, but also geopolitically with events like North Korea and other macroeconomic trends. So although we had to take these into account when we put certain probable statistics on these events occurring, we then manage our fund actively throughout this and we position ourselves in that way going forward. You mentioned earnings. Could you talk maybe about how much you learn from earnings calls, what you look look for on them, and anything along those lines? Yeah, so when we look at earnings calls, the reason we look at the calls is because for the question and answer segment, we really want to see what's being asked and what's being asked over again. Also, when we go into earnings, it's a little company specific because each company, especially with growth, really has a specific area that's driving it, so we want to target that and see how that aspect's doing. If I could touch on that real quick, we also like to listen to the, the management and see how confident they are within their own answers and the questions because that definitely, if they dance around questions a little bit, it can seem a little bit less poised for growth in the future. Uh, excellent presentation, guys. Um, what was the biggest challenge that you as a group faced this semester? Definitely, uh, at times, the cohesion, especially during the late, late nights, wasn't all there. The hardest part is getting everyone on one page. When it does happen, and all the cohesion is there, we are the most efficient unit you can possibly have. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 A, a negative, was there ever a negative experience with these, with these earning, earnings plays? You sound very, very successful to get great results. Was there an example? Any lessons learned that was a, a nasty lesson? 
Oh, yeah, so one company that we did take their earnings in our value fund was Intel, um, and what we saw with them was that we're still very uh, confident with them going forward. However, their client computing segment got hurt a little bit because less people were open more an app to go out and buy PCs. So we did see that guidance moving forward and bring them down, but we're still very confident with that going forward. <laughs> Uh, what's the justification for Shopify? It doesn't seem to have any Yes. So Shopify, we were trying, it was towards the end of the semester, we were trying to decide if we wanted to do an earnings play. And then Shopify was a company we were looking at since basically February. Um, the fundamentals typically aren't your cafe fundamentals, but since we were putting 2.5% of our fund in it, we felt confident that we were hedged against the risk with it. And basically Shopify is a online e-commerce platform maker. So there's a huge demand for them there. And actually within the two weeks we held them, we made about 7%. Short-term holdings and the growth fund somewhat tax efficient for most investors, taxable investors. Um, I mean, sorry, can you repeat that real quick, sir? I was saying, is it somewhat tax inefficient on the growth fund for short-term holdings and realizing short-term capital gains are for ordinary tax rates as opposed to longer holdings? That's yeah. wonderful. Now, uh, if I may answer that, gang, yeah. 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 One, of the, one of the benefits that we have being the Roger Wayne Centuristi is that we are tax exempt. We are tax exempt. Uh, in terms of the way that uh, the student fund managers will probably address that question too, is to be able to talk to you a little bit more with regards to our turnover ratio and how our turnover ratio is still lower than that of industry right now. So of our direct competitors, thus, we see that from a taxable basis, we're doing much better, even if we wanted to include that into our savings and into our returns. I mean, obviously, all these taxable investors are looking at an after-tax return. Absolutely, yes, yes. So we were very fortunate for the setting that we were in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Griffin? Yeah, Griffin, 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 um, all right, so when it came to T-Mobile and the value fund, we looked at all of the uh, telecom sec companies in the sector, and there were certain fundamentals that we couldn't uh, adhere to with Doc um, within the semester. So that's where we saw a little growthy value within our value fund is never a bad thing. Just to touch on that a little bit, too, um, in terms of T-Mobile going forward, Verizon, Sprint, AT&T, they're all following the same model right now in terms of tremendous capital expenditure, way more than T-Mobile right now. And the trend going in with T-Mobile is their CEO is unique, trying to re-innovate things. John McGeer is, I think, poised to really make that company succeed, succeed rather. And going forward, I think that the, he will mainly be the driver in terms of re uh, rejuvenating the company per se. Great presentation, guys. It really was fantastic. The sleep depravity that's what Was there ever a situation in which you guys maybe made the correlation matrix or somebody was really excited about a stock and they got voted out? Or sort of a really difficult situation where you had to sort of kick out a holding, you know, or it didn't really fit within your strategy, even though you thought that from a bottom up perspective it might be really great. Okay. So a situation where a stock got kicked out during our value pitch week was with Cerner. Uh, the stock I pitched, I just love the company it was in that the right industry for healthcare, and I was, I was really passionate about it. Just all the growth drivers going forward with it, but uh, we saw they were losing market share to other companies, and some of the other fund managers uh, brought on the consensus that maybe it wasn't the best time to get into Cerner. Even though I did identify all the different value aspects of it, great fundamentals, great, great just industry to be in in general, and I think. That's more one area we disagreed on, but yeah, that does happen from time to time. And I'll touch on that too. I mean, from our, us having done this a couple of times, Carla's been through this a few times, we've all been through it. Um, we all have those companies that we love and that we pitch constantly. Zach was talking my ear off about Shopify since February. Um, we, all have, we all have those companies, so there's definitely a lot of that. It's all just about the Socratic method and really trying to get those and prove that they're the right company for the fund. You mentioned uh, in the presentation that you were able to go to Japan. Uh, I wonder if you guys can touch on that. What you were able to see, what you learned, and you know, how that culture compares to uh, the rest of America. 
Japan was probably one of the best experiences, of, I could say, for all of, us, all of our lives. It was incredible. We actually got to go and present to the Tokyo Stock Exchange, as well as to uh, Toto Toilet Factory, which they actually had their investor presentation present to us, and we did it to them as well, because we went in there as if we were going to invest them before our value fund. So Japan was, was unreal. We saw all the great sites, had some weird food. <laughs> it was really, really good. Um, yeah, so you, thank you for bringing it up. We do want to thank MJX Asset Management and then also all of you CAFE alumni. I'm sure you guys, for those of you who were at the luncheon, you heard about the success of the CAFE Capital Campaign. Um, it's because of this and because of you guys' generosity that we were able to go to Tokyo. It was an unbelievable experience. Bank of Japan, Tokyo Stock Exchange, Toto Toilets. Um, yes, we did go to a toilet company. Um, so that experience is all thanks to the Cafe Capital Campaign and MJX Asset Management. So we just wanted to thank you guys very much for that. Well, I just want to thank all of you for a really, really terrific job. Let's give them a hand. But that's okay. Um, we, we do always try to make a point at this presentation to extend a special thanks to the people who are very special friends to this program. And two of them are Hans Christensen uh, and Mario Cabelli. And Mr. Christensen has been a big supporter of the trips abroad that are characteristic of this program and that are just such incredible experiences for our students every time they take place. And Mr. Gabelli has been a friend to the school and has been uh, the person who has been supportive of the Bloomberg technology that makes this program possible over a long period of time. So even though they're not here, I would like to give them a round of applause for all of them. Certainly not least, uh, this, not, this would never have been possible without Dr. Michael Melton. <laughs> I, I've worked at some other business schools that have had student investing programs, but usually they're managed really by uh, J.P. Morgan or, or somebody. But this, this fund is managed by our students. They buy and they sell and they make those decisions and they work really hard. So excellent job. I hope everybody will be able to uh, stay for a little while and visit with us. There's a reception set up in the foyer outside. Uh, you'll have more chance to talk with the students and hear about their great insights into investing. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you again for coming today. Congratulations.